as you just heard, my grandfather invented Silly String. So here is one of the original cans of Silly String. You see a picture there. No, I'm not going to spray it on you. The question that many of you have, did they make any money off of it? A little. And so since my grandmother has moved in with us, we now live in a house that's partially funded by Silly String, which is a pretty cool fact. <laughs> One ironic part about this, my grandfather is most well known for this, but he was a little embarrassed about it because he was a chemist, he was an inventor, he had a garage full of chemicals, he had a complete lab out there, which I had to clean up after he passed away. And he thought of himself as a respectable chemist. Respectable chemists don't invent toys. And so he was kind of embarrassed that this was his most well-known product. That's not something a proper chemist does. And our topic tonight is proper and improper. And you can think of proper and improper things in all kinds of areas of life. Uh, just one example having to do with this room. My very first class at Biola was in this room. I taught a class here with 40 students. Let me tell you, there's more than 40 of you in here right now. And so even when I forced them all to sit in the front, in the middle, it was still really hard to have a conversation. This is not a proper room for a 40-student Bible class. And I've been fortunate to be in classrooms since then that are much more proper for a Bible class. Although, shameless plug for study tour I'm leading, the best place for a Bible class is Israel. <laughs> so... Darian Lockett and I are leading a group of undergrads to Israel next year. If you want to come, please send me an email. We'd love to have you join us May 9th to the 29th. Come to Israel. It's going to be a great time. Tonight, though, we are talking about proper and improper prayer. When you think about proper prayer, you probably think about these kinds of categories. Praise, thanksgiving, confession of sin, supplication. When you pray, this is how you're supposed to pray. But there are times in life when we go to pray, and these kind of things do not come naturally. Recent days have given us many opportunities to have this kind of experience. When we see the world full of natural disasters, of earthquakes and hurricanes, when we see horrific tragedies, as we saw a few days ago, our minds do not naturally turn first to praise, thanksgiving, we instead have feelings of frustration with God, of bitterness. Why didn't you stop these things? You're God. What happened here? And so our topic tonight is going to be how to pray when you're frustrated with God. What we're going to focus on tonight is a lament psalm. We're going to focus on Psalm 13. It's frankly pretty random. The lament psalms are very common in the Psalter. They're the, the most common type. So there's any number of Psalms I could have picked for this. But Psalm 13, I think, is one of the most helpful for us because it's short, so we can go through it quickly. As you can see here, the Lament Psalm begins with a complaint. How long, Yahweh? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? You feel the frustration the psalmist is expressing here? The lament psalms immediately tell us the proper response to this frustration is not to ignore it, is not to pretend that you don't feel it, is not to just push it down and let it fester down there while you think about something else. The lament psalms are so helpful for us because they give us a way to express these negative emotions that we have with God. Look again at the complaint. Think about whose fault is this? The psalmist is blaming someone. The first thing I want to highlight is it's not because of the psalmist's sin. There are a variety of other psalms. Psalm 51 is one of the most well-known. David's prayer after the Uriah Bathsheba incident, where he recognizes his own sin, recognizes the difficulties caused by that, he repents, and so on. The laments are not usually that category. And many of the laments have a statement of innocence. I haven't sinned. I haven't done these horrible things. And yet, where are you, God? Did you forget me? So the fault is not the psalmist. 
You could say, looking at the end of verse 2 there, how long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Is it the enemy's fault? To some extent, yes. But the key person the psalmist blames is God. Says God, it's your fault. Now, for most of us who have grown up in the evangelical church, that's going to make us really nervous. You're not supposed to say that kind of thing about God. Whoever's fault it is, it's surely not God's. And so we're not even going to think that. The laments, they're so helpful because they give us a way to express those feelings of frustration with God. Feel the passion that the psalmist has. How long, Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? But the lament does not end there. It goes on to prayer. This is the standard second part in a lament. The psalmist turns to God and continues the conversation. This is yet another important lesson from the laments. When you feel frustrated with God, the answer is not to ignore God. We can continue to have conversation with God, and the laments give us a pattern for that. The third section is the statement of trust. Let me read that for us. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. And this is the standard pattern of a lament. It begins with a complaint, and then it ends with a statement of trust. And so it helps us recognize these emotions. It helps us have a place to acknowledge them, express them. But it doesn't leave you there. It helps you move to a place of trust. The Psalms, many of you have noticed this, but I want to emphasize it. They're more about emotion than about facts. If you turn to a Psalm and your primary goal is to learn a fact, you're going to misread it to some extent because it's about emotion. That's what poetry does. The problem is, we usually think of application in terms of fact. We want to learn a principle from the text that we can take and apply to our lives. How do we do that with poetry? Well, one metaphor that I found very helpful is a script. We read a script to know what to do next. What am I supposed to say next? Where do I go next? And so on. Well, the laments give us a script for knowing what to do when we have these negative emotions about God. We complain. We say to God, these are what I'm feeling. You have left me. What is wrong with you? And then it helps us know what to do next. It doesn't just leave you there. It brings you to prayer and then finally to a statement of trust. It's a script for us to follow as we experience those negative emotions. The key for the Lament Psalms is knowing how to make that transition. How do you get from the complaint to the trust? Because that's much easier said than done. And the laments don't really give us a really clearly worded way of doing it. But there's some hints. So I want to spend a few minutes looking at some of these hints. How do we get from complaint to trust? Psalm 13, I think, immediately gives us a hint. Although I first want to emphasize the answer is not usually a change in situation. It's not as if by the time we get to the end of the psalm, life is better. And so all those causes for complaint are just gone. That's not how we make the shift. Life is just as terrible at the end as at the beginning. And so when you read the laments, don't expect your life to immediately get better. The first hint we see is one we already saw in Psalm 13. It's prayer. How do we move from complaint to trust? Well, if the first stage we do is prayer. Let me go back and read that for us. Verse 3, consider and answer me, Yahweh my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice, because I am shaken. And so, the first hint, pray. Even when you don't like God, keep on praying. Continue that conversation with him. Other laments have other hints. One that I want to read a few verses from is Psalm 73. It begins with a, a statement of, of hope, of trust. Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But verse 2, the lament begins. 
As for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And so the lament here is the wicked are prospering. And the psalmist says, that's not the way it's supposed to be, God. Like, what are you doing? They're supposed to be punished. God, haven't you read Proverbs? The wicked are supposed to be punished. What's wrong with you? And the lament continues on for many, many verses until finally we get to verse 16 and there's a change. But when I thought how to understand this, that the wicked are prospering, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. So he went into the sanctuary of God. The sanctuary of God is a special place in Israel where God meets his people and it's the gathering place for God's people. I think the reference here is to immersing yourself in the people of God, which is often what we don't feel like doing when we're frustrated with God. We're frustrated with God and his people. But the laments remind us, don't give up on God's people. Immerse yourself in the people of God as well. The final part of that verse also says, then I discerned their end. It reminds us of the importance of change in perspective. It's not just the short term, I see the wicked prospering right now, but we can see the big picture of what God is doing in the world. And that change in perspective can help us move from complaint to trust as well. Psalm 1 is, I think, a reader's guide for the psalm. It's the very first one that you read in the Psalter. And I think it gives us some instructions for how to read. How do you read the rest of them? Well, the key word in Psalm 1 is meditate. And so I think that idea of meditation is also a hint for us in these laments. How do we move from complaint to trust? One possible avenue is meditating on God's words. Immerse yourself in the word of God. Now, I'm sure you've noticed by now, these are not exactly revolutionary thoughts. These are just standard spiritual formation principles, standard spiritual disciplines. Pray, immerse yourself in the people of God, meditate on the word of God. But as important as they are for spiritual formation, they're also important in this process of lamenting, of moving from the complaint to the trust. One more psalm I'd like to look at in this section, Psalm 42. This psalm begins immediately with the lament. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Implication, I can't right now for some reason. My tears have been my food day and night, while they, my enemies, say to me all the day long, where is your God? Remember Psalm 13, the psalmist is saying, why'd you forget me, God? Where were you? And now his enemies are telling him the same thing. Your God's forgotten you. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I would go with the throng. Notice past tense. He used to do these things, now he can't anymore. And lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude keeping festival. That's the lament. But then, verse 5, the change in mood. This one's not quite as obvious. I'll read it, you think about it. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. The hint here is, I think, the psalmist starts talking to himself. Now, for us, it tends to be talking to yourself is not a good thing. If you are looking for the seat in the calf and it's really crowded and you finally find a table and there's one person there, but they're having a lively conversation with themselves, you're probably just going to keep on going to some other place. But this kind of talking to yourself, I think is really beneficial. You can do it in your head if you like. You don't need to do it out loud, although that could be helpful. It's reminding yourself of truth. Notice what the psalmist says. Why are you cast down, my soul? Hope in God. He's talking to himself. Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. And so this fits with the change in viewpoint. We know this truth. Let's remind ourselves of this truth. There's a phrase that's been going around for the past few years that I think is really helpful. It's the idea of preaching the gospel to yourself. We usually think of preaching the gospel to all the people out there. They're the ones who need the gospel. I'm a Christian. I'm good. 
But in reality, we all need the gospel on a regular basis. And so I think the psalmist here will be a big fan of this statement. Preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourself of God's love for the world. Remind yourself of the sacrifice on the cross. Remind yourself of that change in us at salvation. Remind yourself of this truth, and that can play an important role in the change for complaint to trust. The Psalter is, of course, meant to be sung. And so I want to shift now to thinking about singing laments. Why should we sing laments in church? We're going to start with the easy case. Let's say you're feeling frustrated with God. Why is it good to sing a lament? Well, the answer is pretty obvious. It gives you a place to vocalize those feelings you have about God. And then it doesn't just leave you there. It helps you transition from those complaints, from that frustration and bitterness against God to trusting God. And so in that case, the lament psalms would be really beneficial. The more difficult case is the second one. What about when you're feeling really happy? Like life is going well, you got an A on a test, your friends are just really great, you love God, you show up to church, you're in a great mood, you're ready to praise God, and the worship leader starts off with this really depressing lament. How can that possibly be good for you? Well, I think several reasons. One is it reminds us not everyone in the room is as happy as you are right now. And there's other people who need that lament. And so it takes us out of ourselves and thinks about the people around you. And also, I hate to tell you this, you're not going to be that happy the rest of your life. That happiness is going to come to an end for a time. And so singing laments helps to train us in the script. What do we do when we have those negative feelings? Singing the laments can give us a pattern for that. So how often do we actually sing laments in our churches? Every semester, I ask my students to make a list of all the laments they can remember that they've sung in their churches. The lists are usually very short. As an example, uh, here's the lyrics from a song from the 80s called As the Deer. Uh, it's based on Psalm 42. We just read through the lament part of Psalm 42 a few moments ago. Go ahead and look at the lyrics. Think about the difference from what you see in the song lyrics to what we just read in Psalm 42. The difference is the whole lament is gone. There's no more complaint. And so for me, this song, in a sense, symbolizes what we tend to do with laments. We're going to take the happy parts. The sad parts, we'll let someone else sing that. We're going to censor those out. I don't really want to go there. There's a category of songs that I call almost laments. These are laments, well, they're not laments. They're at least songs that recognize life is hard. So one of my favorite examples of that is Blessed Be Your Name. Blessed be your name in the land that's plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. So it says desert place, wilderness, to least recognizing life is hard. But it's only an almost lament because... There's no emotional distance from God. There's no emotional difficulty with God. It's just that repeated line all the way through. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. The assumption is, I am ready to trust God every single moment. Doesn't matter what's happening. I'm going to trust God. Now, don't mishear me. I like this song. It's a good song. I just want to be clear. It's not a lament. If we're going to sing laments, this is not it. Another example of an almost lament is, that's too far, go back, go back, work. There we go, desert song. Uh, this is my prayer in the desert when all that's within me feels dry. This is my prayer and my hunger and need. My God is a God who provides. So you hear the hard times vocabulary there. Desert, dry, hunger, need. Life is hard, but still... There's no sense of difficulty with God. It's just, I'm going to trust God. My God's a God who provides. And sometimes that's what we need. But once again, not a lament. I found a few laments. Oh, one of my favorite is from a David Crowder band. Look at the part in bold on the right side. Lord, didn't you see me crying? Didn't you hear me call your name? 
Do you remember Psalm 13? Lord, why are you forgetting me? Why did you turn your face from me? You've forgotten who I am. The second part of this is a riff off the metaphor of giving God your hearts as salvation. Wasn't it you I gave my heart to? I wish you'd remember where you set it down. This is the kind of thing my four-year-old does. He'll pick something up, look at it, walk around the house, put it down, and then have no idea where he put it. And so the lament here is saying, God, are you no better than my four-year-old? I trusted you. I gave you my heart. You lost it. This is a lament. But like a good lament, it doesn't leave you there. The bridge, I didn't notice you were standing here. I didn't notice that was you holding me. I didn't notice you were crying too. I didn't know that was you washing my feet. Another example comes from Stephen Curtis Chapman. Uh, This wonderful song comes from a tragedy in his life. Uh, He has six children. Uh, One of his younger children, one day a five-year-old daughter, was playing in the front yard, and she saw her brother driving home, driving down the road, and so she ran out to the driveway to meet him. And the brother, as he's pulling into the driveway, didn't see her. And she was hit by the car, and she died from her injuries. Now, what do you do in a situation like that? I mean, the short answer is, I, I don't know. I have a six-year-old daughter. I don't know how I would respond to that. But one place to go, you sing laments. Stephen Curtis Chapman has penned this one. Who are you, God? You are turning out to be so much different than I imagined. Where are you, God? Because I'm finding life to be so much harder than I had planned. No, I'm afraid to ask these questions, but you know they are there. And if you know my heart the way I believe you do, you know I believe in you. Still, I have these questions. Like, how could you, God? How could you be so good and strong and make a world that can be so painful? Where were you, God? I knew you had to be right there. I know you never turn your head. You know I'm confused by all this mystery. You know I get afraid. But if you know my heart as completely as I trust you do, you know I trust in you. That's a lament. That's honesty with God. And that helps us move to the place of trust. One last lament psalm I'm going to look at. I call it the ultimate lament psalm. This is Psalm 88. It begins with a prayer, and then it has a strongly worded statement, lament, God rejecting the psalmist. And then there's another prayer. And if you remember the pattern in laments, it's usually the complaint, the prayer, and then the final stage is the statement of trust. And so we expect verse 19 to be that statement of trust. Let me read verse 18 for us, though. You have caused my beloved and my friend to shun me. My companions have become darkness. The end. There's no statement of trust in this psalm. This is the only lament psalm like this. All of them have a statement of trust except for this one. I think the presence of this psalm in the Psalter is a reminder that at some points in our lives, life is so horrific that a lament psalm is just too happy. And for some of you, you might have a a span of time in your life where the best you can do is Psalm 88. You can't even bring yourself to read a lament psalm. Psalm 88, that's the place for you at that time. You can't live there the rest of your life, but many of us will spend time in Psalm 88. There's a psalm for every season. There's happy psalms, there's joyful psalms, there's angry psalms. We haven't even talked about that one yet. There's sad songs, and I think there's a place for all of these emotions. The lament psalms remind us, just like this movie, there's a place for sadness. Sadness is not something to be removed. The goal of the Christian life emphatically is not to remove sadness from your life. The goal of the Christian life is not to be as happy as you can all the time. We need that sadness. The sadness enriches us. And so the lament psalms remind us of that. The lament psalms encourage us to be honest with God. Remember, according to your theology, God knows all things. Why do we hide things from God? 
If there's anything that's more futile, I don't know what it is. If you're feeling frustrated with God, you might as well tell him. And so the lament psalms give us a way, a script for knowing how to do that. It also encourages us to be honest with each other. It's hard to admit we have feelings like this with each other, but we need to develop friendships where we can share these kinds of things. We need more laments in our churches. For those of you who are musically inclined, write some more laments. For those of you who lead worship, put some more in there. We need more. For all of us who are not musically inclined, encourage your church leaders to sing more. Encourage those with you about how we need more laments. I think the laments can so enrich our church today, and we sing so few of them. We need more laments in our churches. Psalm 150 is the very last psalm of the Psalter. Here is the entire psalm. As you read through it, you can see quickly, this is not a lament psalm. Praise Yahweh. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. And on and on it goes. Verse 6, let everything that has breath praise Yahweh. Praise Yahweh. This is the kind of song that we like to sing. But I think its presence at the end of the Psalter is important. To some extent, I think the entire Psalter, all 150 Psalms, are set up like a lament. In other words, you can't get here until you've read a whole bunch of laments first. Yes, we should sing this, but only after we've worked our way through those laments and we've been honest with God and sorting through our emotions. To skip directly to 150 without going through the laments, I think in a sense can cheapen our praise. We need those laments before we get to this kind of praise. As a closing prayer, I just want to read Psalm 13 for us again. Think about the complaints in particular. How long, Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, Yahweh my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say, I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen and amen. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.